do you want answers to all your finance and money related queries then subscribe to our youtube channel now and download the financial freedom app from the link given in description box Hello and welcome to our next session here at Finnovate Asia 2020. I'm here on the virtual stage joined by CS Sudhir. Uh, Sudhir is founder and CEO of financial services comparison and education websites indianmoney.com as well as iamcheated.com. He's also author of the book Love Beyond Death and Health Insurance Handbook. Sudhir, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Of course. So you are here to talk to us about the fintech scene in India. Obviously, India is quite different um, from the rest of Asia. It's quite unique, and there are a lot of uh, interesting points to talk about. So a few of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to talk about the five uses of money. So lending, insurance, saving, investing, and spending, um, and kind of how the Indian fintech scene is working in each of those. We're also going to make a quick note on India's demonetization, um, its view on cryptocurrencies, the possibility of CBDCs, um, and then talk a little bit about regulation. So without further ado, let's dive right into just kind of a general introduction of our topic. Obviously, uh, the global fintech scene um, is quite diverse, given you know the U.S. and Europe, um, as well as um, China and broader Asia, and then developing markets such as Africa. How does India fit into the global fintech scene? I think India, the the fintech uh, companies have got a huge opportunity because of the fact that. Uh, after Prime Minister Modi came to power in 2014, he launched this Jandan program. Because of that, we were able to bring on uh, board about 400 million people into banking system. So about 400 million people opened their bank account for the first time uh, in the last three, four years. So which is a huge opportunity now, right? And uh, and because of Aadhaar, which is the digital identity uh, for every Indian. So that is again in the last nine, 10 years we got it. And because of Aadhaar, many people now have a digital identity. So we call it as JAM. JAM is basically Jandan, Aadhaar and the mobile. So these three things have helping uh, fintech companies to you know innovate and offer better solutions to people and and because of that uh, uh, we have seen a huge amount of innovation and the best part here is india is not just innovating it is also exporting those innovations to different parts of the world mm -hmm. and you would have seen indian technology being used in different parts of the world today so that that way we are doing a lot uh, but in the in the other side, you know, uh, there is a kind of cannibalization happening because of the fact that uh, a lot of government regulations are uh, pretty advanced and which is pro people. And because of that, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, startup uh, uh, innovations are being disrupted, which means uh, government is coming up with like, for example, uh, there were a lot of these payment companies that had done a lot of innovation, they had created wallets, they had created digital payments. And in fact, today in India, a lot of our transactions are happening pretty much uh, digitally, right? Mm -hmm. But then government came up with this uh, uh, innovation called uh, BEAM, uh, the UPI, uh, which is Unified Payment Interface through their uh, government owned uh, 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 authority called NPCI, that is National Payment Corporation. So they came up with this innovation called UPI and due to that, all these payment companies are disrupted. Now these companies are now looking at the next level of innovation to stay relevant in the market now. Yeah, so the government stepped in and kind of helped out uh, innovation right. there. Right. Okay, um, well, let's move on to talk about the five uses of money and kind of what India is doing in each of those. So let's start off with lending. 
Sure. So in the lending space, there are a lot, you know, there are a lot of new age startups who are doing it because in the past, what was happening, all these large commercial banks, they were primarily lending to, you know, the prime customers who are well, you know, who are very much eligible. They have the required, you know, credit uh, history. They have the required income proofs and all those documents. But then for the subprime customers, no one was lending. That's when these lending startups came up. These fintech companies created their own uh, technology to assess the profile and credit uh, risk of these individuals. And then they, they kind of started lending to these subprime customers. So there were uh, different models here. There were lending startups who started lending from their books. There were lending startups who started lending, you know, uh, 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 with a in partnership with the banks by taking a spread, which means they kind of uh, uh, gave that uh, guarantee to the bank that okay, if the if the bad debt or NPA is more than certain percentage, we take the spread. And the third model was basically these lending startups came up with the loan origination platform, which means they were not lending from the books and they had absolutely no risk of NPA, but then they were originating applications for the banks. So out of these three, I feel the success is with the ones who didn't lend from their books and who didn't take any risk because they were only originating applications using better technology. They were helping banks to assess the risk of different individuals using advanced technology, ML and all that. But uh, the second kind of startups during this uh, crisis, uh, okay, something like Corona or in the past also we have seen the startups who are lending from their books and those who were taking risk of lending, they got into trouble because what happened, uh, uh, the bad debt is increasing. They are not able to manage. Not many uh, are doing good there, but then the best part here is see, I'll tell you what is happening with India uh, with, with the lending, uh, the new startups. See, the, the biggest challenge they are facing today is the collections. See, the, the collections are becoming a real big challenge uh, uh, and the cost of collection is really high. That's why they're finding it difficult to sustain. And because of that, the interest rate is really high. These startups are lending at 3% monthly. That is 36% annually. Some yeah. startups are lending. These payday loans are being given to people at literally 4% a month, which is like credit card interest, right? And and uh, four percent a month is like forty eight percent annually, which is like too much. Because yeah. of that, people are not really paying back, and that's where the concern is increasing. And of course, I mean the credit. Though these guys have got all this NBFC license, and they're they're able to now update the credit bureaus with the credit score, and the you know that that is in fact impacting the credit history of these individuals. But then. Uh, many of them are not really bothered about it, right? So we don't know how, how fast uh, this will really change. But as of now, the lending startups, most of them are not in a good shape. Those who are lending from their books. Yeah, so it sounds like default is pretty high kind of across the country, right. which is making it difficult right. to operate in general. Right. Okay, let's move on um, quickly to insurance. So in the insurance space, the insure tech, insure tech companies are doing pretty good. In fact, there's a lot of innovation happening. The best part is uh, the insure tech companies are moving from just distribution to manufacturing of products. Uh, I mean, you would have seen this company called Echo, which is which has got into you know uh, uh, the founders of uh, CoverFox. They started this company called Echo, which is a pure new age. Uh, insure tech company, but that they, they are the manufacturers. They're not just the distributors. And similarly, there's another uh, insure tech company called Dizit. They are also the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have uh, Policy Bazaar, uh, Cover Fox kind of distribution companies as well in this space. So with reference to manufacturing, yes, there is a lot of clarity. Regulation is pretty much go pretty good and the competition is also picking up. Everyone is innovating. They are becoming digitally savvy and they're offering uh, you know, competitive products to the consumers and it is going pretty good. But then in the other side, the distributors are at, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a soup, in a, in a trap because of the fact that the regulation is not so clear there. You know, IRDA uh, allowed insurance companies to launch something called zero commission products. These zero commission products doesn't offer any kind of commission to these distributors or brokers, those online distributors or insure tech companies. Now what is happening? These guys are selling the products online, but they are not able to really make money out of it. Hmm. That is becoming a challenge. 
and uh, unless there is clarity from the regulator on this part intro tech companies may not really go well in the long run so so we need to really work on that aspect because of that if you have seen because policy bazaar raised a lot of money they have big investors to back them policy bazaar is able to still raise a lot more money and able to continue to grow but and others are struggling uh, apart from policy bazaar we have not seen any recent fundraise by other startups in this space i mean coverfox which is the second largest uh, uh, you know insurtech company in india but uh, they are trying to raise funds from a very long time but they are not able to just yeah. that the existing investors are supporting with some small funds but then otherwise they are not able to raise big funds now they are struggling so that's primarily because the cost of selling is very high in india you know mm-hmm. uh, people won't buy buy insurance on their own you they they want you to call them they want you to speak to them on phone which means the cost of selling goes up which in turn makes it difficult for them to sustain their business mm-hmm. yeah yeah so perhaps until the uh, government steps in we might see uh, still some lagging in funding in that area right um, but, but i think the good part here is government has allowed uh, 100% fdi in this uh, insurtech so now we are able to raise lot of funds right earlier it was not allowed it was only 49% then they increased it to 76% now they have increased it to 100% 100% yeah. fdi is allowed now yeah. well let's move on um for time sake to saving and uh, the scene there on the saving front see the problem in india is you know we all are you know we are a saving uh, economy i mean uh, do, the domestic savings in india is very good in 2008 when we had this global uh, uh, financial crisis in india we didn't really suffer much because of the fact that the domestic savings was you know really good you know even today we have our moms saving uh, money in these uh, grocery boxes right you mm-hmm. know they they save money in small boxes at home and and the domestic savings is really good but then that habit habit of that saving is not being uh, uh, you know is not being cultivated online in the digital space like mm-hmm. you have uh, platforms like round off in the us and that is not being replicated in india we don't have uh, such platform to encourage people to save more maybe because the kind of people who use these online platforms are pretty much millennials uh, the age between 20 to 30 they are in the spending spree they are not ready to save and maybe because of that the market is also not ready so but in anyway i mean the, uh, uh, you know in contrast you see lot of startups which are encouraging people to spend not save so i think that's required but then there are a lot of these uh, uh, investment apps which are being created now be it mutual funds or you know uh, 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 the mutual fund distribution or discount broking so that is being really picked up and you see a lot of innovation there and because of that the regulator also came in sebi came in and they have created something called zero commission mutual funds or direct mutual funds in direct mm-hmm. mutual funds brokers make no money absolutely nothing zero and that has made investors believe in the system otherwise what was happening earlier you know the sellers were pushing those products which were giving them high commission but yeah. now since these are direct mutual funds where there's no money and it's all online a lot of these guys are able to drive a huge volume like our uh, the wallet company paytm they started something called paytm money which is a mutual fund distribution platform within a very short span with a very Uh, less investment they are able to drive huge volume but the mm. problem here is again clarity on revenue how are they going to make money when are they going to make money as of now there is absolutely no clarity on how these guys are going to make money so because savings and investments go together right hand in hand because you save money to invest so mm-hmm. the these companies are encouraging them to invest so but the problem is when they like for example paytm money which is now allowing people to invest without really charging anything and mm-hmm. they are also not making any money from the fund houses the amcs asset management companies are not paying anything to paytm which means eventually if paytm has to sustain its business we'll have to charge a small subscription fee to these people to you know keep their show going but then the problem is there are there are so many other competitors so in case if paytm starts charging them a small fee there are high chances that uh, you know these people may move from paytm money to one more platform mm-hmm. 
so that's where I think the regulator will have to think about how to keep these intermediaries alive and afloat, which is a very important thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, let's move on to spending and let's just spend a couple minutes here. We only have about five minutes left and yes. there's still a couple things I want to get to. So give us a rundown on spending. Uh, on the payment side, there is a lot of innovation happening. The best part here is about four or five years back, uh, Reserve Bank of India, our central bank, uh, came up with this new regulation which allowed uh, Reserve Bank of India to issue payments bank license. The payment bank license is basically like Paytm money, Paytm. Paytm was a wallet company. They eventually became a Paytm payments bank. So what are these payment banks? These are the new age banks, something like your challenger banks or neo banks. So they, they kind of provide a wallet facility up to a lakh rupee you can keep in the wallet and spend. And these wallets are integrated everywhere. You get a standard statements of where you spend, how to cut, cut down your expenses. And they also notify them of the offers they, they can actually avail online, all that. Mm -hmm. See, these payments banks and the digital wallets are doing a transformation in this way because uh, I told you about UPI, Unified Payments Interface. That yeah. has actually created a huge, huge impact on the on the society. So you have Google Pay. Google Pay is from Google. And then we have Phone Pay, which is from Walmart uh, backed uh, Flipkart. So these platforms are allowing people to transact online, make digital payments without even a penny of expense, which means they don't have to spend anything, right? It's all free, absolutely yeah. no cost. And that has made payments pretty attractive now and it's doing pretty good. Yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, definitely a positive of the government yeah. stepping in yeah. there for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's move on um, and quickly talk about cryptocurrencies and kind of India's view on um, on cryptocurrencies. So in on the cryptocurrency part, I mean, we had a lot of smaller exchanges or their representatives promoting cryptocurrency in India. There was a lot of media push on that. But then RBI came up and said uh, cryptocurrencies is not legal in India. They didn't yeah. say it's illegal, but they said it is not legal in India. And they, then then uh, these cryptocurrency mafia, they literally went to uh, a Supreme Court. They they represented to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court came and said, uh, you know, uh, they, they kind of put a stay on this order from Reserve mm -hmm. Bank of India. And then we thought, uh, you know, uh, people actually marketed that as cryptocurrencies are now legal in India. But wow. then now government of in India has given a shock saying that we are now coming up with a law to ban cryptocurrencies in India. And this is in line with uh, Reserve Bank of India's uh, ambition to come up with its own digital currency sometime soon. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have mentioned uh, already that they will soon launch in the due course. So we really don't know when, but then it's going to happen. It is in the cards. Okay, so we'll keep an eye out for the government to launch a CBDC, then that'll be interesting to see. Absolutely. Um, compares with the rest of the globe. Okay, we have about two minutes left. Let's kind of wrap it up. I'd like to talk just about how you think uh, regulation is working in India, how it's working for fintechs, how it's working against fintechs, and is it good or is it bad? I think the best part here is the government is literally challenging these startups. Instead of just letting them do whatever they want to, government is coming up with the next step. Like you do A, the government says, I'm doing B now. Then the startups have to explore C. And mm -hmm. when they reach C, government comes back and say, I'm doing D now. Which means at every stage, government is challenging these startups, which yeah. is a pro people activity, which is a pro people action, which is really good for the country, which is really good for the public. At the same time, it is also challenging these startups to innovate better, more, which means mm -hmm. these guys can't settle down. Being a, being a fintech, if you settle down, you become irrelevant within six months. Yeah. You have to continuously innovate, which is good. I think uh, the countries outside India will have to look at India's model and probably they have to replicate how India is kind of challenging these startups to uh, innovate and make it better. Yeah, well, great. Well, that's all we have time for. I wish we could chat more. There's so many more questions I have, but uh, Suhir, thank you so much for joining us and to our audience, thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure, thank you.
we all are running the race of life. Yes, 780 crore people are running this race, but very few people have got 1 lakh crore, 5 lakh crore, 10 lakh crore of assets and the others are struggling for even 10,000 rupees. Why is this happening? Take a look at 100 meter running race. If 20 people are running the race, all 20 will reach the goal, but then the one who reaches first will win the game. Why is this not happening in the race of life? It is because those who are running in this 100 meter running race, they know their target, they know the path to get to their target. But unfortunately, in the race of life, most of us don't have a goal and those who have a goal don't know the path to get to their goal and those who know the path to get to their goal, they don't have the strength to run. Then who are these rich people? Where do they come from? How did they become rich? Yes, there are no shortcuts to become rich. There are secrets to become rich. Do you want to learn the secrets to become rich? Now, you can get all those secrets of rich people in one place together right in Financial Freedom App. Download Financial Freedom App and start your journey to become rich.